All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Avi, for the introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, given that this is going to be a, a rather long presentation, there is a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to get started. Um, so we're going to be talking about the characterization of the slanted cylinder after body wake and the, um, another project, which is the experimental optimization of active flow control. Uh, well, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Avi. Uh, this was a, a great, a great ride, and as, it, as he said, I got to play with a very, very nice toys, uh, and also the committee for all the suggestions and, and everything that the, that all the discussions that we had. So I also would like to thank the. For some reason, it didn't pass the slide. Let me see. Oh no. Okay, got it. So I, w I would also like to thank all of the crew in AME and FCAP. Uh, it, it's been uh, several hundreds of hours of conversations and discussions, and I appreciate you, you spending the time and uh, uh, helping me building my character and also my, my knowledge base so, so I, can, uh, I can reach the point that I'm at right now. Uh, I forgive if I uh, uh, forgive me if I forgot your name. <laughs> uh, and uh, on the Ohio State University, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gretonda's group. They were very instrumental in providing computational support for this and also uh, discussions uh, in general. All right, so let's get to the to the motivation to this work. So we're looking in an industrial problem, which is the the vortex pair that uh, appears downstream of the slanted surface of a cargo aircraft. So this, uh, this representation here is a C, uh, C-130 aircraft, and we, we know that there is a pair of counter-rotating vortices behind it, and this is uh, usually an issue with a cargo drop. We get an uh, inaccuracy in the cargo drop, and also it's uh, dangerous for paratroopers. Uh, here is like a video, uh, hopefully the video is playing, uh, if not, tell me, the, of the parachute, uh, troopers jumping off of the aircraft. And as you can see, the, par the, the canopy of the parachutes actually interacts with the flow field uh, behind of the aircraft. Uh, and furthermore, we also have a little bit of a contribution to fuselage drag. Uh, especially sorry, especially in, the, in the case of paratroopers, uh, there is a dangerous scenario called the toe jumper scenario, where the parachute soldiers, they, in this case, they're, so they're jumping from the ramp of the aircraft, uh, and this soldier here, he's gonna circled. He his his line is not gonna be detached from the from the the parachute's not gonna detach from the line, which means that he's now hung on the aircraft, and he's being towed by it. And this is quite a dangerous scenario. And usually they have to cut the line in order for him to deploy his emergency parachute. But uh, what can happen is he can get like a, a he can get stuck in the vortex. And then he gets spinning out of control, and if you cut the line, then he might not be able to deploy the emergency. And in that case, uh, we we actually uh, there's a lot of reports of lives that have been lost, especially of uh, of student uh, paratroopers uh, on on this uh, due to this scenario. Uh, this one survived, but um, uh, it's it's very uh, it's very difficult. So of course, this motivates us to understand this flow a little bit better. Okay, so now let's go into the. Uh, into the model that we're looking at. So we're looking into the slanted cylinder or the cylinder with the slanted afterbody, which is a simplification of the, of the general aircraft model uh, with the slanted surface. Uh, it's basically a bullet model with a slanted surface in the back. And on the left here, you're seeing the, the, um, the experimental uh, physical um, configuration of the setup, uh, where we have the slanted cylinder with a, uh, with a, a strut mount uh, with a wing. Okay, um, so what do we know about this flow topology? So in, in 1980, there was uh, a very interesting study by, by Thomas Morel. Uh, he basically uh, used several slant angles, several models with several slant, ang slant angles, and he measured the drag coefficient in a wind tunnel at the Reynolds number of 100,000. And what he observed is that there is a, a, a drag crisis. So as you make this slant angle from shallow uh, all the way to, to, to steep, you get increasing, uh, increasing drag, but then eventually the drag, uh, it uh, sharply drops to a much lower value, actually lower than the values that you begun with, uh, which, is, um, which is regarded as a drag crisis, and it's seen in several other models that have a bluff body weight like this. Uh, so this is actually uh, regarded as uh, uh, two regimes in this flow. 
So the, the shallow slant angle would, would be producing the vortex pair, and this is the slant, the slant angles uh, range that we're more interested in, for aircraft at least. And on the red side here, uh, we're gonna have the wake regime where we have a fully separated bluff body wake. So, uh, okay, so we know this just from drag measurements, but this is of course conjecture, right? So the, uh, very recently there, there was a study by, by uh, University of Bath where they performed uh, sparse PIV planes uh, looking at the vortex uh, and a single vortex. And they observed the vorticity of this uh, slanted cylinder and they compared this with the cargo door open configuration where they observed this weakening of the vortex uh, in, the, uh, in the cargo door open configuration. Uh, uh, on the computational side, uh, there it's worth highlighting uh, the study by Garman and Fisbal, also very recent, uh, where they performed uh, high resolution, high fidelity LES computations, and they observe also the same uh, uh, vortex pair structure. Uh, and uh, um, uh, by the way, this study is actually later than our study, but um, uh, it's just a little timing thing. Uh, okay, so uh, now let's look into the, the physical model. So this is a, a picture of the model. We use the subsonic wind tunnel for, for this study. Uh, we, we use free stream velocities all the way from 0.3 meters per second to 70. So this is more than two orders of magnitude. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens in the low end uh, that we wanted to explore. And we used four different slant angles in the study. The three slant angles, 20, 32, and 45, are related to the, to the vortex state. 45 has some interesting behavior we're gonna discuss in the hysteresis and 50 has uh, just a wake state. So our, in our experiment, we used uh, flow visualization techniques. That's, I think, the, the specialty of FCAP. Uh, we used uh, oil flow visualization, hot wire anemometry for looking at details of this flow, and base pressure measurements, uh, which I'm not gonna discuss in this, uh, but uh, it's, in the, it's in the paper. And uh, most importantly, uh, we did lots of PAV. So we did all, all kinds of flavors of PIV except for tomographic, uh, but we did something very similar to tomographic. And these are all the planes that we examined, looking at several different small features that, that are present in this flow to satisfy our curiosity and understand more of this flow. Okay, so now uh, let's examine the results. So first I'm gonna discuss the mean flow features uh, to under so everyone can have an understanding of how this flow looks like and what the progress that we made in, this, uh, in the mean flow topology. So, uh, we first performed oil flow visualization. It's a very useful um, technique that gives us a lot of information. And this is a little movie of the development of the oil flow. So you see the flow direction here. This is a 32 degree slant angle case. And you can see here the oil flow developing and forming these uh, beautiful sideways structures. So these, uh, these structures are actually, uh, if we now we uh, examine the, the flow topology, this sideways motion is actually the footprint of the vortex pair. And uh, it smoothly transitions into uh, the footprint of a separation bubble at the, uh, at the leading edge. So these features we identified, and this kind of leads us to believe there is a, like a, a continuous structure that uh, is a horseshoe kind of vortex. But this was, uh, of course, the first hint at it. Uh, we also observed other uh, uh, secondary features that uh, I'm not gonna cover here uh, for the sake of time. Uh, if we look at other slant angles, uh, we observe a similar development of the oil flow. It's gonna play again. Uh, on the vortex state. So for uh, the features are pretty much the, the same and the only difference is the, the size of the features. So the separation region here is, is tiny at the 20 degrees. It increases inside at uh, 32 and it becomes very large at, at, at 45 degrees. But the presence of the horseshoe structure is uh, ubiquitous uh, in this vortex regime. If we, if we look at the a slice in the center plane with PIV, and we, we measured the size of the separation bubble and we compared that with oil flow, uh, we get a, a very interesting trend, which is, uh, I guess, uh, expected, that the separation bubble increases in size if you reduce the Reynolds number. So for all slant angles, so each color here represents a slant, a slant angle, we see there's a, a trend of increasing size as we slow down the flow. Uh, but the, at higher Reynolds numbers, this trend seems to flatten out which is an indication that the flow perhaps is uh, fully transitioned to uh, a turbulent state that uh, maintains a similar size of the separation bubble. Uh, we would like to do further uh, higher Reynolds number studies to confirm this. Okay, um, now uh, I, I just, uh, just a quick explanation of how we acquired the three-dimensional data on this flow. So stereoscopic PIV, we, we uh, 
see the flow with smoke and then we use two cameras to look at the at the uh, plane illuminated with a laser sheet uh, but uh, in this case we we actually we used a somewhat novel apparatus where we synchronize the traversing of the cameras and the laser such that we don't lose focus and don't lose calibration which means that we can sweep the planes of interrogation in in a pretty fast way and without requiring recalibration of the cameras and this allows us to acquire uh, uh, several planes that we can stitch together in post-processing allowing for a volumetric reconstruction of this flow field so if we if we look at this volumetric reconstructions uh, I'm, I'm showing here and this is fully volumetric we have all the three dimensional vectors for each one of the planes so we can actually get all of the all of the velocity components uh, in, th in 3d um, so we, we look at the volumetric reconstructions and we see the horseshoe structure in both slant angles 32 and 45 degrees uh, to our amusement, I guess. Um, and these, uh, these uh, um, by the way, uh, uh, was published as a, as a data set uh, that we uh, uh, open access data set that can be used for uh, purpose of validation of computational efforts in the future, uh, which I think is also uh, an important contribution for this, uh, from this work. Uh, okay, so uh, on the mean flow topology, I, the, uh, there's a lot of details, but I think we, we, we have a fairly good understanding of how this, this flow field looks like. And this is a picture of, like a summary picture of all of the flow features that we identified that would be worthwhile looking uh, closely if we we're targeting a study on this uh, or similar flow topologies. Uh, this picture is uh, published in our JFM paper, uh, published in April 2020. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to shift to the second part of this talk, which is the unsteady uh, behavior of this flow. So um, this, this flow has this pair of counter-rotating vortices, and if we look at them in slow motion, this is a captured at 20 kilohertz uh, PIV fields, and we're playing at, uh, I think, 15 frames per second. Probably for you, it's playing at one frame per second because of the connection. But uh, if, you, if you pay attention here, you see that the vortex is, doing, is wobbling, in a sense. And this, uh, this is uh, regarded as the vortex wandering phenomenon. Um, and of course, we want to characterize and see if there's any interesting behavior in this, in this vortex, vortex wandering. So uh, let's examine the plane uh, in red here, uh, where we have the full picture of the vortex. It's an easier examination. Uh, so how, how can we examine this? So one thing that we can do is track the core position. But tracking the core position is, is, um, is, is a little complicated with experimental fields. Uh, and we, we were able to do this uh, only with a quantity gamma one, which is an integral quantity that uh, uh, has the effect of averaging out the noise on the experimental fields. Uh, if we look at the time series and of, this, um, of the coordinate of this core, now we converted this whole three-dimensional flow field into a simple X and Y coordinate. So this is a, a data compression technique in a sense. Uh, we, we, we can see that gamma one performs much better and you, it actually identifies correctly the vortex core as uh, a, a human qualitatively will look at the field and would define, oh, this would be the core of the vortex. So, so then uh, we apply this technique and um, we get the time series. And this time series can be analyzed with a Fourier analysis. If we do a Fourier analysis at the vortex core X and Y coordinates, uh, we observe the the um, the presence of peaks and this is something that uh, i think uh, is perhaps expected but uh, it's the first time that we comprehensively show this in uh, at several reynolds numbers so each one of these charts here is one reynolds number and uh, we we see the presence of the peaks but uh, not only that but we also see there seems to be some uh, co some bands where the peaks are more likely to uh, appear so if we if we look at the um, uh, if we plot only the prominent peaks uh, 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 as a function of Reynolds number, we can see that they they stay uh, contained within these two ranges, uh, which uh, which is an indication that this might be um, uh, a behavior uh, re relative to some non-dimensional variable. In this case, the normalized uh, uh, frequency. Um, of course, we want to make sure this is not a fluke, right? So we compare this, uh, the small triangles in the spectra represent the ex expected frequencies from this flow, uh, both from the, the strut that's mounting the model. Uh, it would be shedding uh, some, some coherent structures. We want to make sure that those are not 
um, uh, affecting your spectra, but also from the fan blade passage and, and the duct acoustic modes that would perhaps excite some instability in this flow. And uh, we, uh, we don't see any correlation, uh, which is a good indication that this coherent wandering is, is there. Uh, and also it's observed in CFD, so that's also another, uh, another good uh, indication that this is there. Uh, okay, so then we performed uh, proper orthogonal decomposition, which is another data compression technique. And uh, we observed that the, if we look at only the vortex, uh, we see that the, the, um, the most uh, dominant modes, they are correlated to the helical mode of this vortex pair. Uh, oh, sorry, of this, uh, of a single vortex. Um, it might not be very clear, but uh, let me just perhaps attempt to explain here. So we're looking at a single vortex, but when, uh, when we look at the first mode, we actually see two counter-rotating vorticity pockets around the core of the vortex, which means that if we superpose this in the mean, we actually get any horizontal shift in the core of the vortex. And similarly for mode two, we get any vertical shift, which means that we, we can actually com uh, combine the two modes to produce any circular motion of this vortex. This is why, why it's regarded as a helical mode. Uh, if, we, if we use a reduced, reduced order model where we only use the mean and only one of the modes and we apply the gamma one algorithm to track the vortex core, uh, we, we actually get a fairly decent reproduction of the time series of the core. Uh, if we use, for example, the X uh, coordinate uh, and we only use mode one, we reproduce the entirety of the X wandering of the vortex and similarly for the Y wandering, for 32 degrees. Uh, for 45 degrees, we only see the, the, the lower frequency behaviors being ob uh, observed or reproduced, and the higher frequency peak is not, uh, is not uh, uh, reproduced by the reduced order model, uh, which means that it's actually reproduced, in, uh, it requires more modes. Uh, but we couldn't pinpoint a single mode that would uh, uh, reproduce this uh, high frequency content. Uh, it looks like it's a combination of the modes that, uh, that actually produces this vortex wandering. Uh, so this is uh, something that might be worthwhile looking into in a further study. Okay, uh, another thing that we found uh, quite uh, interesting is that uh, if we look at the correlation coefficient between the x-coordinate of the left-hand vortex and the x-coordinate of the y, uh, of, of the right-hand vortex, and all of the possible combinations, there's po four possible, x, x left, y right, x right, y left, and everything, uh, the correlation coefficients are, are pretty close to zero. They're less than 0.2 uh, at high Reynolds number. So you've seen here that I'm showing a 200,000 Reynolds number, uh, which, which uh, in, uh, is a fairly good indication that the, the vortex wandering at these high Reynolds numbers is related to uh, the, each vortex independently uh, wandering. It's not like a mode that, that includes the two vortices uh, wandering together. And this, of course, is from, from a, a wider PIV window where we see the two vortices. So this is something that we learned from this. Okay, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the unsteady analysis here and I'm going to shift to the, the third part of the talk, which is uh, hysteresis and bistability behavior in this flow. Uh, but first, before I talk about hysteresis, it's, uh, it's important to discuss the wake state of this flow. So in uh, this flow, uh, we discussed the vortex state. Uh, we observed it in, in the mean uh, sense. But uh, the wake state hasn't been characterized very well uh, for the slanted cylinder uh, so far. So we wanted to make sure that we had that. Uh, so we designed the model uh, with a 50 degree uh, slant angle, which is absolutely in the wake state, in the wake regime. And then we performed the stacked stereoscopic PIV to, to get this three-dimensional flow topology of this wake state. And we do observe this uh, fully separated wake. So there's a, there's a, there's a shear layer all around. Um, I'm just showing the, the, the half of the shear layer because of the occlusion. Um, and inside of the shear layer, the, stream, the volumetric streamlines, they show this, um, this circulation zone that is just open separation bubble. Uh, and also we observe this uh, very interesting uh, tornado-like structure upstream of the circulation bubble. And uh, in the left-hand side, you're seeing here this same tornado structure, but only surface constraint streamlines. So it shows like there's a swirling vortex, um, um, tornado-like vortex. Uh, if we do oil flow on this uh, on this 50 degrees land angle where we have the wake state, um, what we see is well we see the same flow topology, but uh, it's just another way of, of looking at it. So you're seeing here there there's upstream movement on this direction and uh, on this downstream zone, and on the upstream zone there's downstream motion, which is actually quite confusing when you look at it first because if you compare 
the vortex regime uh, at 45 degrees versus the wake regime at 50 degrees, so it's a five degree difference, uh, we see that the, this zone, uh, there is a saddle point in both oil flow topologies, but one is a source-like saddle point, and the other is more like a sink-like saddle point where the, the streamlines are pointing towards it. Uh, and this is quite confusing uh, at first glance. But of course, this is just because uh, in the fully separated wake, we have uh, the separation bubble uh, features are actually greatly magnified and they cover the entirety of the separation bubble. So we see uh, this region here in the wake state is actually enlarged uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the wake state. So uh, we were able to observe that and characterize and show all of the details. So, okay, so then um, now to the hysteresis itself. So uh, I, I was talking about the 50 degrees length angle. So now we're gonna shift to the 45 degrees length angle where we observed only the vortex state. Uh, it's a, there's a study by Brister in 1991 that seems to hint that this 45 degrees length angle has hysteresis and we wanted to observe and examine it further. So uh, we performed the, the, the following experiment. We stair step the wind tunnel, slowly accelerating at every, every stage of the stair stepping uh, to you know, ensure there's no acceleration effect. And we, what we observe is that very low Reynolds numbers, the, the, the 45 degrees length angle actually has the wake regime. So the, the separation bubble, in, if we look at the uh, a center slice, it looks like an open separation. But then uh, we reach a slant angle, in this case, uh, sorry, a Reynolds number, in this case, uh, 31,000, where when we increase it by just a little bit, 1,000, the flow suddenly transitions to the vortex regime. And we know this is the vortex regime because the closed separation bubble indicates there is a, a vortex uh, in this, and we're gonna show this, uh, prove that further in, down, down in the slides. Uh, and now if we decrease the, the Reynolds number, we don't see this, uh, this transition back to the wake state until uh, the, the, the Reynolds number of 6,200, which means that we actually have an overlap between when the flow transitions from the vortex state to the wake state and when the, the vice versa transition happens. So this hysteresis window is actually from 6,000 to 32,000, basically. And this is, a, this is a somewhat interesting behavior. The reason why we wanted to see this is because we're collaborating with the Ohio State group uh, and this, this Reynolds number range is, is well within LES capabilities right now, uh, which means that uh, uh, we, we don't know which flow state we're getting, right? So uh, of course we had to do the stack stereoscopic PIV technique on this one also. Uh, so we, we matched the, the same Reynolds number, which is 25,000 uh, in computations. Uh, and uh, you see, the, this is the same exact Reynolds number and the same exact uh, slant angle. And the only difference is how we got here, right? So in the left-hand side, we slowly accelerate the wind tunnel, whereas in the right-hand side, we accelerate the wind tunnel uh, past the transition Reynolds number. And then when we back off a little bit, then we, we, we acquire the data, but the vortex state in this case is maintained. So we have this uh, data set and this, uh, this duality of this data set uh, is interesting. And of course, we also publish this um, to help validation of CFD codes in the future, capturing this transition, this interesting transition behavior. Of course, we were rather curious if this behavior would also happen at other slant angles. So uh, we had a 32 degrees slant angle available. So we attempted the experiment at 32 degrees and indeed, the 32 degrees length angle also shows, and this is of course, uh, this is the first time in the literature we're, we're showing this, it also shows the same uh, hysteresis behavior, uh, which is uh, very interesting and uh, uh, of course it's perhaps expected, but uh, we are the first experimentally proving that's the case. Uh, of course the hysteresis window is much shorter, we have a hysteresis from 5000 to, to 8700, but it might actually be wider and it might be that the, our experimental facility is uh, perhaps a little bit too noisy to, to widen the hysteresis window enough. But uh, it, it is there and uh, this proves that this phenomenon is robust enough to, to be observed even in a facility that doesn't have much treatment. Okay, so um, if we put this in perspective and we plot the, uh, everything that we have about this, uh, this uh, uh, model in, from the literature, all the flow states that we observed, plus the states that we attempted to observe uh, uh, probing the hysteresis band, we, we see a very interesting behavior that um, 
Um, basically, we, well, we don't expect any strange behavior to happen between 32 and 45 degrees, right? So we, it's fair to assume that there is at least some degree of interpolation that can be done in the hysteresis bounds. Uh, and if that's the case, then, well, they, they should come to an apex. Uh, but this is, of course, extrapolation of our data. Uh, but the, this suggests there is a, a cusp, cusp catastrophe-like phenomenon. And this is a mathematical thing, uh, it's like a stability mathematical thing that attempts to describe this uh, hysteresis type phenomena and is, is very common in dynamical systems. Um, so we showed this uh, flow pattern map and uh, we hope that this uh, might be able to inform further studies uh, in this uh, hysteresis zone uh, for this geometry. Uh, okay, so now let's look a little bit further in how this transition happens. So if we look at the, uh, at the, we start with the stalled regime. So we're at the higher Reynolds number range of this transition. And we uh, accelerate the wind tunnel. We captured this with the high speed PIV. So now I'm showing a high speed PIV movie. Uh, on the left, you're seeing the raw particle images. And on the right, you're seeing the, and perhaps they're not going to be very well uh, easily seen uh, given the, the lag. But uh, on the right-hand side, you're seeing the, the processed flow field. And what you can see is that the separation, the, sorry, the shear layer of, of the separation, it, it starts, um, looks like it starts laminar, and then it, it starts mixing through the kelvin helmholtz instability. And this mixing eventually makes it large enough that it seems to, to touch the, the, the trailing edge of the, of the model. And when th that happens, then it, that state of the closed separation bubble, that, that is the size of the entirety of the model, that state doesn't seem to be stable, which means that now it quickly zips back into the, the, the closed separation bubble uh, that we have. So I'm just going to kind of go back and forth here so you can see the separation bubble um, um, decreasing in size. Uh, so this, is a, this seems to be the, the driving mechanism for, for the, the transition from stalled to uh, uh, vortex regime. Uh, on the other side, on the opposite side of the transition, uh, what we observe from, from stereoscopic PAV in the vortex is that, uh, and this is a non-time resolved, we observe that the, uh, the, if we track the core and we take the, the standard deviation of, this, uh, of the tracking coordinates, we observe that this, which is a proxy for wandering amplitude, like how much the vortex is wandering physically, uh, we observe that the, the vortex wandering increases as we dive deeper in the hysteresis band. And this seems to suggest that it, it is the interaction between the two vortices that, that um, um, causes the stall. Uh, we also seem to have some, uh, if we do time resolved PIV on this, uh, we, and we examine the correlation coefficient between the coordinates of the two vortices. Remember that I said in the, in the unsteady analysis that the, there is no correlation at high Reynolds numbers. Well, in, at low Reynolds numbers, uh, this correlation coefficient seems to increase. And if we look at the, the higher uh, Reynolds number range of this uh, study, uh, we see that the correlation coefficient is still fairly low, but it's increasing. But then, and these are the time series uh, uh, corresponding to that. But then when we go to the very lowest Reynolds numbers, uh, we see the correlation coefficient is, is very high and it seems that it, it the vortices, they, they are either in sync or out of sync, uh, which seems to suggest that they're interacting. There's some modal behavior or limit cycle between the two vortices. Um, so this is, this is a, uh, of course, it's, a, it's, it's not a, a hard evidence. We didn't observe the, the actual transition happening, but um, I think it's a, a very good indication that there is some vortex pair interaction between the two vortices that precedes the stall. So, so this, uh, just uh, summarizing the hysteresis part, we, we were able to observe hysteresis in this flow. It's a, it's a very common phenomenon, I guess, but um, the, we were able to characterize it and provide a strong and detailed data set that can be used for future validation purposes. Uh, uh, and furthermore, the, the mechanisms that drive the transition, they, they're clearly different. So in, uh, in, in one direction, we have the attachment of the shear layer, whereas in the other direction, we seem to have an interaction between the two vortices. And this is probably why we have the hysteresis window to begin with. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the, the third part here and I'm gonna talk about the last part. Hopefully I'm gonna have enough time for that. Uh, I think it's the more exciting part, which is the experimental optimization of actuator location for active flow control. Um, 
So this, this study uh, was motivated by, by the following question. Uh, we know that active flow control is, being, is, uh, is a promising technology, uh, but uh, there's, there's still a lot of challenge finding where we should put our actuators. So in, in our case, we're gonna use uh, uh, jets in crossflow as actuators, micro actuators, but uh, we, can, uh, we can use um, any kind of actuator in a sense, right? Uh, but the question is, where do I put them? And um, I, I was perhaps a little uh, dissatisfied with the state of the art, because if we do experiments, we're constrained to doing to just using our intuition and defining uh, uh, locations for the actuators that are hopefully receptive to actuation. Uh, and of course, it, it makes sense, right? I mean, we, we, we know that boundary layers, this has been shown, that boundary layers and shear layers respond to, to active flow control. But uh, we, I don't think we know the implementation details as well. And, this, and I think this, is, this plays a role. And since we can't uh, deploy many configurations in a single experiment uh, because of machining limitations, then uh, this slows down our progress. And I, I felt that perhaps was a, was a, a problem. Uh, so of course we can use a, a more theoretical uh, based approach, which I think is also gonna be quite useful in the, in the future, uh, which is uh, using, uh, using the Neverstoke solution uh, linearize the number uh, around the solution and then uh, use some model analysis technique like resolvent or stability analysis to find modes that this uh, this flow is receptive to but the the, the problem I have with this technique uh, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping in, in some toes here but uh, the problem I have with this is uh, uh, is that we don't know what these modes are going to do when they grow beyond the linear assumption uh, which means that uh, uh, and we do have an actuation goal right we want to either reduce drag or improve noise characteristics or improve performance of an aircraft and this these are hard actuation goals and we don't know what these modes are going to do and and which means that we're still kind of in the dark in a sense so uh, i i felt that we might be able to do a little better so then um, uh, what we can do uh, is we can leverage the power of experimental facilities as supercomputers Right. The experimental facilities, they, they, they solve the fully nonlinear number stokes by just the fact of you blowing the wind through the uh, on the model, uh, which means that we, we can test several configurations that would take uh, an, an insane amount of computational time. Uh, and as long as we have an optimization goal function, we can arrive at uh, workable solutions, perhaps not, not global optimal solutions, but uh, workable solutions for engineering purposes. Uh, and so it's a practical approach, and it has the direct engineering apl application for other geometries, right? Uh, and uh, I think uh, the the question here is also we as experimentalists uh, we 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 are more well equipped to build uh, automated data acquisition systems. Uh, we this is basically what we do as a trade, and we just want to help, right? I mean, we want to contribute to the progress and. And uh, sometimes we, we, have, uh, we have to wait for someone in the computational side to give us an answer, and this is a little unsettling in a sense. So we just wanna help, right, in a sense. Uh, so then I set myself to do um, uh, uh, an individually addressable array of microjets to basically empower the wind tunnel uh, to perform the optimization with the wind tunnel in the loop. So, um, so we basically frame the jet placement problem as an optimization problem. And this, uh, although this exact, uh, like using the jet placement problem hasn't been done in the past, uh, what has been done in the past and that has, been, has inspired me is experimental optimization studies on parameters of one single actuator, uh, one single actuator. And that has been done by others uh, like um, uh, Steve Bur Burton and other groups uh, in the past. Okay, so because we're academics, we get to name stuff. So um, I'm defining here uh, my, my jets in my uh, active flow control array as uh, jexels. And the reason for that is because each one of the jexels would be a pixel in an image of jets that I wanna find to, uh, to optimize my goal function. So I, I don't care which ones are the jets that, uh, that optimize the goal function, or I don't know, but I wanna find which ones are the best ones. And so I'm, I'm asking the computer to form an image for me. And of course we have to, to do a trade-off here uh, because we, we, we have um, a limited amount of solenoid valves that we can fit inside the model. So this is a limitation of the experiment. 
So I would rather have each single jet uh, be controlled by its individual valve, but uh, uh, of course this uh, is, is very hard to do. So we, we settled for a pocket of four jets with us, its own chamber that's connected to a pneumatic channel. So this is a Jetso, uh, and we have 59 of them. So then uh, I, I went out and built a custom design system to uh, power these uh, Jetsos. And this comprises of a solenoid manifold and a driver board, a big microcontroller based uh, driver board. It was a lot of fun and we have power to, to drive uh, 100 channels with a, a sampling rate of uh, 50,000 Hertz, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, okay, so implementation this details aside, uh, let's talk about the, the, the cost function, right? Because we, we're doing optimization and we wanna find a cost function. And I think the more obvious cost function is the drag of this model. But uh, unfortunately, due to our um, limitations in our experimental apparatuses, uh, the drag uncertainty in, in, the, in the Reynolds number that we were interested where the drag is known uh, is, is quite large. I think it was two, two or two and a half percent for the equi equipment that we have, uh, which means that uh, I, I wasn't re really sure that that would succeed. And in order to improve or maximize the, the chances of success of the study, I, def I decided to, to move away from drag and this, uh, I decided to, to go and define another cost function that is proportional to drag, which is the circulation of the vortex core. So we traverse a vortex with a three-dimensional CNC uh, in the wind tunnel. Uh, in the tip is mounted a, a four-hole probe that ve measures the three-dimensional velocity, local velocity vector. And if we use the circulation integral, we can find the circulation. And it has been shown in the literature for this, for this model, circulation is proportional to drag. And it makes sense, right? The, the slanted surface is the only lift producing surface. So whatever the wingtip vortices of this surface are gonna be uh, producing lift and drag, right? So it, it does make sense. Okay, uh, so then uh, uh, here is a, 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 the part where I, I perhaps ask uh, the audience to give it some thought on what would you do if you were the engineer and defining this, right? If you, if you were to define what is the actuation strategy you want, and you were limited by, not by having a, uh, the hardware that, 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 that I'm presenting here, but uh, just a machining. So you would have to machine only a few of them. And it would be, uh, it would be quite um, um, difficult to find an optimal solution, right? So we have here actuation patterns that are more, um, 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 I guess, well accepted in the literature. For example, we can energize the boundary layer with an array of, of jets uh, upstream of the shear layer, or we can have perhaps the jets closer to the shear layer. Uh, there are some other actuator patterns. These are all manual patterns that I actually attempted. Uh, these random patterns are not very clear why they're, the, they're there, right? But if we actually measure the, the, the cost function, in this case, the, the drag reduction cost function, uh, what we see is that the, this solution F is, is very good at reducing the drag. And also that this randomly looking solution H is the second place uh, for this particular set of images, uh, which is not very straightforward to, to understand why, right? Uh, and the manual solutions, they, they don't perform very well, except for solution E, but that uses twice as many jets. Uh, so um, how did I go about finding solution F? That's the question, right? So uh, I used the, uh, I defined the cost function, I used the, set up the hardware, and I used a, a genetic algorithm. So the genetic algorithm is shown, I'm gonna show a time lapse of my experiment here. So on the right hand side, you're seeing the images, uh, the, sorry, the, the, um, the JAXO configurations that the genetic algorithm is attempting. And on the left hand side, you're seeing the best current configuration that was attained. And what we see is that the, uh, the, the cost function, which is, is here is, is this bar, right? The, the higher the bar, the better. Uh, we, we see that the cost function is uh, mostly, uh, every time the, the generic algorithm alters it, it mostly fails, but sometimes it succeeds. And when it does succeed, then that configuration becomes the lead configuration in the, in the generation. And that uh, keeps on improving just for, by, uh, uh, by the power of the genetic algorithm. Uh, so this, uh, this is a time lapse that so we actually ran for 50 generations, 51 generations, uh, through, uh, through over the course of five days, 24, five, 24 hour, five days. Um, 
and the this is a, a bird's eye view of the results that we obtained in this uh, in this experiment. Uh, and you you can see that the, the genetic algorithm does slowly improve as uh, the generations pass. And these are the configurations that uh, kind of uh, were the breakthroughs. Every time we got a change in the pattern, we we, we call it a breakthrough in this case. But uh, I think uh, everyone here can agree that the configurations, they look very similar. They look similarly random. Uh, so if you look at the configuration, the best configuration G30 here, uh, we, we have this pattern that's not very easy to distinguish from the pattern uh, of G6. And this is a little unsettling, right? We, we don't like random uh, looking configurations and it's very hard to draw any understanding from that. So I, I went a little uh, step further and I performed a process called in the electronics industry munzing, where we basically remove, uh, we attempt to remove the unnecessary stuff by just removing components, in this case, the jaxels, until the system breaks down. And here you're seeing a chart of the cost function versus the, the number of jaxels deactivated. And as we can see here, most of the jaxels in the, the genetic algorithm were completely useless. Uh, but then we see a tipping point uh, at uh, minus 12 jaxels, and then every next jaxel that we turn off actually affects the cost function by a great extent, uh, which means that uh, all of the all of these jaxels are actually quite necessary for the solution. Um, so, and this solution looks much more interpretable, right? We we might be able to actually get some some flow physics understanding from this, but I also must address the fact that it looks uh, asymmetric. So. Um, we, of course, we were looking at only one vortex, so we're going to get an asymmetric uh, solution. And this is, ju this is uh, just the algorithm uh, working as intended. It's not a bug, it's a feature, right? Uh, the algorithm is optimizing for the thing it's seen. But we know that this is not what we want, right? We want, we want the two vortices to, to be reduced such that we actually get the estimated drag reduction. So then if we force the symmetry and we perform PIV, which is a more accurate estimate of circulation, then we get a um, uh, similar drag reduction, uh, a, a similar circulation reduction of 10% in the two vortices. And this, I think, would be a more uh, uh, correct estimate of how much we got from this study, uh, about 10%. If we look at the vorticity profile of these vortices, what we see is that the vorticity from, from the baseline versus the, the actuated case, the symmetric one, we see that vorticity decreases all over the vortex which means that uh, we actually prevented vorticity from being generated. Uh, it's not that the vortex is being more diffused and we're just measuring a more diffused vortex or something like that. The, we actually succeeded, in a sense, in preventing vorticity from being generated. So that's a very interesting physical interpretation of this. Uh, if we now we do flow visualization to, to understand more about the solution, uh, what we see, and I'm just going to refresh you of, of the baseline, uh, this is oil flow visualization, the flow is in, uh, as the arrow shows, and we see the solution, uh, uh, the horseshoe vortex uh, of uh, forming as expected, right? But then, uh, now I'm going to turn off the jets, sorry, turn on the jets, and you're going to see the oil flow pattern respond to it. And of course, it's low speed, so the oil flow pattern has trouble responding to it, but we can see clearly the, the, uh, a change in the oil flow topology. Uh, because the, because it's so slow, I re-ran the experiment by having the jets on prior to turning on the wind tunnel, and this is the topology that we get. And uh, as you can see, the the arc that is formed uh, is, is or is an indication of the counter rotating uh, the hairpin vortex in a sense. Uh, but um, uh, the topology is much different. It's much closer to the leading edge. Uh, if we turn off the jets, then we see this massive change in the flow topology. Uh, and I, I think, at least to my knowledge, this is one of the more, more significant changes in flow topology uh, caused by active flow control, which is quite exciting. Um, yeah, so the, uh, there's other features that I'm not going to discuss here. So, so then uh, uh, we, we performed PIV to, to look further into the solution. Uh, and of course, in baseline, it shows just a separation bubble. Uh, if we look at the separation bubble, which is the plane highlighted in blue. But then if we look at the genetic algorithm solution, then we see... Uh, uh, well, first, we don't see the separation bubble here, uh, but we see this strange blue feature here that is not a separation bubble. And I'm honestly not sure what it is. It, it, it looks like the flow uh, is attached and then it uh, detaches and forms perhaps some, some uh, three-dimensional flow topology here. And this, this warrants, I guess, more 
study. Uh, this is something that I currently don't completely understand. Uh, I'm sorry for that. There's, there's only so much you can do, right? Uh, if we if we do model decomposition on the baseline, just so you can kind of have a sense, we we see the more energetic modes are related to the breathing of the separation bubble and the shear layer. That's uh, that's expected. But if we do the model decomposition on the genetic solution, the genetic algorithm, uh, we see the traveling a traveling wave mode pair, which is uh, very interesting because it, it either hints, uh, we don't know the direction because this was not time resolved, but this hints at either an increased vortex wandering that's sending an upstream wave, that would be an, one interpretation, or another is that we, we trigger an instability by using this blowing uh, configuration. But in that case, uh, it's not because the blowing frequency, because the, the, the jets are steady. So there is no inherent frequency here. Um, so the instability would be just because we, we reduce the size of the separation bubble, perhaps. OK, so uh, now I'm going to move on. Uh, bear with me. I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, uh, we performed a little bit of uh, computational uh, RANs on this. Uh, as a disclaimer, I am not a specialist in, in computational studies but I did my best here to attempt to understand the solution further. Uh, we, we used a very refined mesh around the, each one of the jaxels to get uh, attempt to capture the, the effect of each one of the jets. And of course, the boundary layer and everything. Uh, the solutions, they match very well with the, the experiment, the baseline, um, except for some details that are uh, documented in the thesis document. Um, if we look at the, but I think at least for relative comparisons, it might be uh, somewhat useful. Perhaps Dr. Tyra has a different thoughts on that. Uh, but um, the, uh, if we look at the pressure signature of this flow, uh, what we see is that the baseline, uh, we see the, the suction um, profile of the baseline, which is just the footprint of the separation bubble at the vortex pair. Uh, but the genetic algorithm solution has a shorter suction, uh, but the suction peak is actually much larger. So we actually increase the suction, but because the area is less, we, uh, the net effect is, uh, is, is lower suction. Because more suction would be more drag, but in this case, uh, it, it, the net effect is less drag anyways. Um, if we look at the center plane, which we observed with the, with the PIV, uh, we actually see in the CFD solution a tiny little separation bubble, um, which is actually under this uh, suction peak. And this would not be possible to, would, would not have been possible to capture with PIV because it's so short. Uh, the reflection limitations would, would not have enabled us to see that, uh, or we would have to zoom in a lot. Uh, one thing that uh, I found quite particularly interesting and definitely warrants more study is that if we look at the boundary layer profile or the, the display, displacement thickness profile of the, of the baseline versus the genetic algorithm, uh, what we see is that, of course, we, we get, uh, well, first, this, this has a negative displacement thickness, which is just because the boundary layer is actually fuller, given that the flow is already accelerating, even in the, in the baseline. But when we apply the, the jets, then we see even, uh, even more negative displacement thickness, which means that we energize the boundary layer. But not only that, we actually see, and this is uh, not clear by looking at the graph, but I am adding the lines here to, uh, to help the visualization, we see that the, each next jet in the solution increases the, the, the derivative a little bit, which means that uh, every single jaxo here is actually contributing to energizing the boundary layer, uh, which is uh, perhaps uh, uh, expected, given that you know, a microjet and cross flow produces uh, an er uh, a CVP that energizes the boundary layer. But I, I think, uh, and it, I was actually quite surprised, I didn't see any jets in tandem study for active flow control. But it looks like jets in tandem would be uh, uh, something to look into a little further um, to energize the boundary layer more, let's say, in some cases. Okay, uh, so uh, a few further thoughts. So uh, we know that for flow structure energization is important. I think this is already established in the flow control literature. But uh, the implementation details and how exactly this happens, they're crucial. and. I think that this platform enables us to, to find those implementation details or not worry too much about them because the platform enables us to find it. Uh, I think uh, uh, also a lesson learned from this is that the jets in tandem should definitely be looked into a little further. So there's a little picture of how they look like in the CFD solution. Uh, I think that the, they, they might actually produce more energization of the boundary layer, which might be warranted in some flow control applications. And uh, 
I couldn't really understand completely what is the role of the jets downstream uh, in the in the slanted surface, but but from experimental evidence, they are absolutely necessary because you lose about three or four percent of the eleven percent circulation reduction by turning them off, uh, which means that they're they're definitely useful. But it's just that I couldn't nail down exactly what was the flow physics uh, behind that. And uh, I think that uh, most importantly, this platform can empower our experimental facilities, especially at much higher Reynolds numbers, right? To, to produce more contribution and more progress to the active flow control, which is uh, something that uh, we, we, I think we can learn much more and I'm quite excited to see what, what else we can do with this platform. Okay, so, so this is uh, all I have. So now I'm just gonna kind of summarize. So on the first part, we discussed about the mean flow topology. Uh, we got a good understanding of uh, how this mean flow topology works. We published this data set, this carefully, data set, uh, carefully acquired data set for validation of computational studies. Uh, and we established quantitative trends, both in vortex circulation and in separation bubble sizes and all of the other features that we see in this flow. Uh, on the unsteady side, we identified coherent vortex wandering in the experiment. And we, it seems to be correlated with the helical mode of the vortex. Uh, on, the, on the third part, we identified hysteresis and we characterize it thoroughly uh, and also at multiple slant angles, which uh, I think is uh, going to be useful for uh, other studies in the future. And finally, in the experimental optimization, we came up with a new novel platform that enables us to find out uh, the, the, the implementation details of this actuation strategy such that we, we know that we want to energize a boundary layer, but we don't know how, well, let's just put some actuators there and let the computer find out, right? That's how you guess the philosophy of this. And I think this will enable us to, to make farther progress and faster progress in, in the flow control community. Um, and also uh, we found that the genetic algorithm outperforms uh, a human, right? And uh, by a, hu a human, I'm, I'm saying my advisor, Dr. Alvin. Uh, I'm just kidding, uh, <laughs> the, in, in finding better actuator, uh, actuator patterns. Uh, okay, so I'm going to leave you with the publications that I was able to, to uh, put in, out in, uh, during this study, uh, one of which is actually not even related to the study. Uh, and I'll take any questions from the audience. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fernando. Uh, you made it in uh, 50 minutes, so that's okay. Like that. No, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> All right. So the 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 way this is gonna progress is if we have any questions, comments from the audience, non-committee members, uh, please go ahead. Uh, this is your time. So you can just turn on your camera and your mic and speak up. Don't worry to ask hard questions. I've always been doing that, so it's it's fine. <laughs> and uh, Professor Gatanda, you are an honorary committee member, but you can ask now. Yeah, well, <laughs> thanks. So, Fernando, as always, uh, really remarkable uh, presentation and the work also. I got to give you a lot of credit for this. Uh, well, first one was a comment, actually, on slide 53. I think you mentioned that you were not sure what was happening with the separation on the symmetry plane. Uh, this one, right? Yeah. Yeah, this, this uh, I, I think. Yeah, I think this is very reasonable. Um, so the separation, the, the, the symmetry plane is not a 2D plane. It cannot be. If you if you saw a center over there, you know, like a regular center, uh, I would be concerned. But you're not. You're seeing actually two, what look like two, uh, one saddle and one node. That's perfect. I think this is correct. I'll send you a paper on this. I uh, see your point. Yeah. So you're saying you're saying that there's there's a a, a, a sink here and a source here, right? So, uh, yeah. Something like that. It, yeah. I don't, well, so, actually, sorry, my my bad. They're both actually sources in a way. Okay. So the saddle could be considered a sink because there's a side that you're missing, right? I mean, the third direction, there's fluid mm -hmm. coming in. So I it's see. a saddle, two sides come in and two sides go out, right, in a saddle. Mm -hmm. So this is, in fact, I think, correct. If you had showed me a center, I'd be a little more concerned. Um, the other question I have, the question I have is uh, about the genetic algorithm. Right? This is really an amazing thing. So there is one step in there that's the mutation step, right? I mean, the thing where you okay. allow the solutions to mutate. I think you... uh, because in real life, mutations are very important for progress, right? I mean, that is what makes us different all the time. Like yes, certain... yes. How, how, did, how did you do that in your... In your well, the, I, I implemented a custom implementation. I didn't use a, like a MATLAB package. Uh, I didn't find it uh, powerful enough for what I needed. So mainly because I did want the algorithm to change the number of Jexels 
in each uh, like as the the system progressed and if i had like a, a just an array of coordinates uh, like a, of uh, indices that wouldn't have been possible because the array would be of the of, of a fixed size so i did implement a mutation but there's mutation in several uh, steps mutation uh, I, I i think i didn't touch into this in the presentation but the, this genetic algorithm is actually examining the back pressure the frequency and also the phase angle between the actuators. Uh, the, the back pressure I, was actually, I think, found by the, the algorithm the, because we, it was within the range and it turns out that uh, I think the jet would overshoot the boundary layer if it was more. But um, the, the frequency didn't seem to have any effect, uh, perhaps because we didn't have an upper, the upper band of our frequency range was below frequencies related to boundary layer, shear layer for this Reynolds number. So in our case, we have 200 hertz as the uh, as the frequency upper upper bound of a frequency, and the uh, shear layer structures would be much higher than that. So so this is a uh, uh, I guess coming back to the mutation step, mutation happens in all of these parameters, even in the the address of the jacksaw. So for example, if I wanted to mutate this, one of the routines that runs is uh, get select uh, find a, a random number. That random number finds you know which uh, how many jets you want to change in the mutation step and then given that n random number find uh, random other coordinates for this jet and then um, change the coordinates accordingly so this would be one of the mutation steps and the others are just uh, randomly perturbing the, the the position of the frequency or the duty cycle or, or other variables thanks yeah that that's very good thank you and also, I think you, you did mention that there are only so much details you mentioned that you did explore the frequency and found out the, the steady state was driven to the steady state, which is blowing all the time of the optimal from the frequency. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's more like a, because of the, of the limited time response of the, of the solenoids. Oh, the solenoids. We get, right. Yeah, we get more flow uh, at the higher frequencies. We get much more flow at the, at the DC. Uh, it's a but at the higher end of the frequencies, it's a, about eighty five percent of the DC flow, and this means that the the smoothness of the of the parameter surface is is easier for the genetic algorithm to traverse in the direction of the uh, uh, uphill in a sense to, towards the higher frequencies. Uh, it would have to hit spot on at zero hertz, you know, and that's something that's much less likely given the randomness of the genetic algorithm. And I also wanted to add uh, to the comment that Professor uh, Capone made about your, first of all, uh, that uh, I did not encourage him to do the simulation, but he went ahead and did it anyways. But I think that uh, the, the control, the GA solution you know, from your RANS simulation, uh, there is a, probably a three dimensional separation that would be restricted downstream. Fernando and I talked about it a little bit. Um, yeah, so I, think, I think there might be a three dimensional feature here. But the, right. the computational solution did not capture that, yeah. right. and I I feel like a, that 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 is a limitation on, on the on the turbulence modeling. So so I don't want to hog this thing, but actually what you're seeing is three dimensional. If it were two dimensional, you would see uh, a center. You know, you would see a point in the middle. If if there's two dimensional separation, there's always a point around which it's almost like a circle or an ellipse. You're not seeing that. And that's why this is in fact three dimensional. I, I can I can explain it to you later. So yeah, so it would it would be the two dimensional would be more like this, right? Like in the left hand side, something like that. But yeah. even there, right? I mean, in general, a three D flow like this will never see a two D on the symmetry plane. They're really profoundly topologically different, though, because uh, it, it's essentially completely unstable. That if if you get a two D solution on a three D symmetry plane, it's entirely unstable unless Basically, the spanwise domain is infinite, which means it is 2D, right? Yeah, which would be 2D, I see. Which would be 2D. So if it's right. not infinite, like yours is certainly not infinite, if you see a 2D looking solution on the symmetry plane, you should be you should be concerned. Mm -hmm. I'll send you a paper, it's, it's a bit subtle. Yeah, please, yeah, I would like to see. I mean, topology is always, is always fascinating. Yeah, it is, okay. And uh, I think Nana gave me too much play by calling me a human, but that's okay. Sorry, you, said, I, you said human expert or something like that. No, no, no. I was just kidding. I mean, I, 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 I came up with the observation. Yeah, 
But uh, yeah, it was just a joke. Anyone else from the audience? Okay. Thank you, Dada. I know you got to go. Okay, so well, if we have no other questions from the general audience, I'll ask the committee members to stay back, but everybody, one else can leave. And I want to thank you for Fernando for a nice presentation. And you can clap virtually, symbolically. There you go. Uh, and we will, uh, we can celebrate with him in six months from now in person. <laughs> All right, so the committee members will stay back. We'll wait for everyone else to leave. All right, good job, Fernando. Thanks, Prabhu. Appreciate it.